Uh, hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you to our webinar um, by University of Georgia and also Texas AM University. We certainly appreciate your time listening to this webinar, and we are looking forward to talking with you today about the marketing and risk management program for U.S. cotton producers under the current coronavirus um, pandemic. We'd like to thank Dr. Aaron Smith from the University of Tennessee for organizing and coordinating this webinar. Uh, I would like to start with a brief introduction for me and then let Dr. Robinson introduce himself as well. Uh, I'm Yang Xuan Liu. This is my third year here at the University of Georgia, serving as assistant professor in the Agriculture and Applied Economics Department. I also serve as a cotton extension economist for University of Georgia Extension Services. John. Hello, this is John Robinson. I'm an extension economist in Texas with Texas A&M Extension and AgriLife Extension Service. Uh, I've been working uh, for a number of years on different crops in different parts of the state. For the last 15 years, I've been uh, the cotton marketing specialist. Okay, to start with um, today's webinar, uh, let's take a look at the cotton supply and demand situation. On the right bar in this graph is the world cotton supply and the black line is the world cotton demand. For the past two years, since 2018 and 2019, the upward trend of the global cotton demand stopped. Um, the April USDA forecast for 2019 and 2020 marketing year has world cotton consumption down 6.4% or 7.6 million bills from last month's forecast. The current forecast of world demand is at 111 million bills. The world cotton supply is stable and it's at a relatively high level. With the supply outpacing demand, we have seen up downward pressure on cotton A index uh, for cotton prices globally. Uh, I have been tracking the number for the world cotton demand since 2018. USDA has gradually adjusted down their forecast for 2018 and 2019 cotton demand globally. Um, let's take a closer look at the adjustment of this number for the 2019 and 2020 marketing year. The first release of the world cotton demand uh, forecast was in May of last year. Uh, at that time, the world cotton demand for 2019 and 2020 marketing year was forecasted at, at 126 million bills. And world cotton supply was a little bit lower um, than demand at 125 million bills. Over time, due to the uncertainty of, in, of international trade and its corresponding slower economic growth globally, USDA gradually adjusted down their forecast of world cotton demand until March of 2020 of this year. Then what is happening for the sharp drop uh, of the forecast for the world cotton demand in April 2020? And why does the global cotton demand drop uh, over time? Uh, John, I know you have been follow following the global economic situation and let's hear your explanation for this drop. Yeah, if we could advance it to that slide there. So I would, I would say that the, the first uh, or the earlier uh, reasons for declining economic growth are depicted in this, um, I'll call this my baseline GDP projection. This is from the IMF, and this is what they published last October. And what, what we would have discussed and pointed out then was there was a slowing in uh, in economic growth around the world there was a slowing of the of the uptick that we saw in the united states and and we would attribute that slowing to the drag on the economy from from all the tariffs and and the not just the trade war tariff situation with china but all the other tariffs that the united states the trump administration had imposed on on a number of countries um and we would look at those tariffs as a drag, but, but with the projection being that we would still, you know, swallow that and then come out of it somewhat. So that was the discussion then. Of course, all that has changed. We can advance it to the next slide. Now the situation isn't a question of, well, what are the effects of tariffs or what's the benefit of the phase one agreement with China or what's the effect of the Federal Reserve 
adjusting interest rates. Now the, the single question, the main question is what's the effect of, you know, consumers around the world um, being sheltered at home and, and businesses around the world being shuttered uh, in response to this pandemic. And, you know, for most crops and from, and for many, uh, manufactured products and retail products, we, you know, we would only expect a huge decline in demand from the fact that, you know, people aren't shopping except for essential things. So the IMF here, what you're seeing is a projection of over, uh, it's, it's over a 3% decline in world GDP. And that's a larger dip. It's a, it's a larger recessionary dip than what we saw during the great recession of 2009. Now, fortunately, I'm, I'm, I hope the IMF is correct. They're projecting a rather rapid recovery. They're assuming that the pandemic problem is gonna fade away as a medical problem in the fall and that uh, the economies of the United States and the world will come bouncing back even to a stronger position there they were. That's what's depicted in this graph here. And I sure hope to heck that's, that's correct. But basically how deep and how wide this graph is, is a particular importance uh, for the question of cotton consumption, because I think cotton is tied more directly to the, how the general economy uh, goes than most other agricultural crops. Um, and part of the reason for that, if you think of the difference between cotton and grains or meats, um, cotton is probably the most discretionary ag product I can think of or apparel is the most discretionary because apparel is semi-durable and people can put off purchases of new wardrobes and new home furnishings and furnishings and things like that. So it's, it's typical in the past when we see recessionary dips that there's drops in cotton consumption. This, this time around, it's, it's exceptional, I would say, because of the level of you know, sheltering. And if you just think just this year, just this spring, all of the spring wardrobe, all the Easter dresses and all the things that were not purchased and they're not gonna be purchased when people start coming back, if they start coming back this summer and in the fall, I mean, a whole season's worth of apparel is was just missed. And so that's gonna have ripple effects um, through the cotton supply chain. That's gonna take a long time, in my opinion, it's gonna take many, many months uh, for things to normalize, but we can't help but expect um, reduced demand all the way up the supply chain to the Lent market. Now, so far, the most that we've seen that happen is in recent export sales. We've seen, we've seen some cancellations, but the expectation is that we, we may see more. We may see more of that. And USDA is, is uh, reflecting that in some of the, in the April WASD and some of the adjustments that Yang Chuan was talking about. And I believe that she has a few more to show you. Um, so what John is anticipating uh, in terms of the drop in demand for cotton is also supported by the unexpected reduction in cotton mill use data released by USDA. Uh, so the reduction observed for the major cotton spent countries uh, across the world uh, due to this rapid um, spread of COVID-19. So as shown in this graph, um, the reduction in cotton mill use this month are spread across all consuming countries compared to last month's forecast. It is also a lot lower than last year's cotton mill yields. Um, the global cotton supply chain is also severely impacted due to COVID-19. So for example, um, cotton spending in China fell by uh, at upward of 90% during the height of the pandemic in early March. Um, the spending and other manufacturing sectors in China have begun to recover now, uh, however, with the anticipation of declining con consumers' consumption of apparel, recovery of the spending industry to the pre-COVID period uh, might be limited for this marketing year. The virus is also spreading very quickly in Turkey, India, and Pakistan right now. Um, travel restrictions are implemented in India, Pakistan, and Vietnam, also likely to have similar impact on their spending industry like what happened in China. So the global uh, retail sales clothing and taxi tail, as John mentioned, has also dropped tremendously this year. So many non-essential business, uh, including the April store, are closed. 
So with the rising rate of unemployment uh, happening globally right now, the dispensable income from consumer uh, April is also going to be limited for the cotton demand for this year. Uh, now let's take a look at another source of supply in terms of cotton endings, uh, global cotton ending stocks. The world ending stocks are projected at the highest level, third highest level for the past decade and currently at 91 million bales. Especially stocks outside of China are projected at the highest, highest level for the past decade at 56 million bales. There is a fundamental differences of cotton stocks inside of China and cotton stocks outside of China. As the stock inside of China are held in governmental reserves, uh, which move cotton from trading in the market. However, stocks outside of China are traded in the marketplace. This increase in ending stocks outside of China creates further downward pressure on global cotton prices. Uh, now let's switch here to the supply and demand situation in the U.S. Uh, the orange line in this graph represents the U.S. cotton production. For the 2019-2020 marketing year, production is currently focused at 19.8 million bales, which is second highest for the past decade. The blue line represents the U.S. cotton demand, including cotton exports and also domestic use. Exports are currently forecasted at 50 million bills, down 1.5 million bills from last month's forecast. Uh, on average, over 80% of cotton production in the U.S. enter into the global market, so international trade is very critical to ensure cotton profitability. Um, the domestic consumption of cotton is forecasted at 3 million bills, uh, which is the lowest level for the past decade. As a result, as you can see in this graph, um, the ending stocks are represented by the purple bar on the bottom. For the 2019 and 2020 crop year, I expect it to increase to the highest level for the past decade and at 6 and 7 million bills. This has created downward pressure on cotton prices domestically. Um, let's further look at the demand side. Um, this graph shows the top trading partners for U.S. cotton. China used to be the largest uh, trading partner and customer for U.S. cotton. Uh, in 2014, China cotton policy switched from price supports and building government reserve to paying growers with direct cash payment. Um, China also implemented a tariff rate quota system at that time. So this system determined the amount of cotton cotton import at a low tariff rate within the quarter, and then beyond the quarter, there will be a higher tariff rate. So as a result of this policy, in 2015, Vietnam surpassed China and became the largest trading partner with U.S. Uh, Vietnam has also become the middle link for global cotton supply chain uh, in terms of making and spending, and then they were able to export ER and fabric at a duty-free level to China. So this change of global cotton supply chain happened way before um, the China-U.S. trade dispute started in early 2018. However, the trade dispute speed up this moving of spending industry outside of China. And the data for um, 2019 in this, uh, in this graph is not available yet, um, but compared the 2018 to 2017, we export more cotton to Vietnam and India. And China used to buy U.S. cotton with a very large shipment, um, but now we have to export cotton to multiple countries, as represented in 2018, uh, in the bar of 2018. And this export is relatively small shipment. So our cotton basis has been lower than previous years due to this, uh, due to this small shipment uh, since the trade dispute. Um, China is still the largest cotton spending in many in the, uh, country in the world, and um, they still need cotton. So when we uh, ship less cotton, cotton to China, uh, where does the cotton coming from? So this graph is from our colleague, um, Dr. Andrew Mohammed from the University of Tennessee. It shows the China cotton import by different source. Uh, we used to have uh, the largest market share in the Chinese market, However, due to the trade dispute um, between U.S. and China, our market share dropped. Brazil and Australia has benefited a lot from the loss of market share 
or market opportunity or U.S. pattern in China. In addition to that, the global export market, Brazil is becoming our largest competitor for cotton export, as shown in this graph. Um, the Brazil cotton export has been rising rapidly in the past four years and is expecting to continue rising in the coming years. So the decline of global cotton demand on trade uncertainty, increased level of global competition, and economic reception due to COVID-19, all this factor combined with downward pressure for U.S. cotton prices. Um, back in October, uh, back in August, uh, September, and October of last year, cotton prices dropped to the lowest 60 and upper 50 cents per pound at that time. This is because of the market was anticipating a historical high U.S. cotton production. However, as the crop become more uh, as the crop become more mature, US, uh, USDA has adjusted down the production level and then reduces cotton ending stocks. Then prices recovers. After the signing of phase one tra uh, trade deal between US and China, the market confidence recovers slightly and cotton prices recover slightly. Um, however, um, the phase one trade deal uh, is a the phase one trade deal is expected to increase the export to China. However, the global pandemic things is uh, still up in the air. The more recent drop in prices is largely due to a demand shock, uh, with the price of being so low around 50 cents, uh, 50 cents per pound during the planting season. This will definitely impact farmers planting decisions for this year. So now let's take a look at the planting decisions from the prospective planting report. Um, this report shows the total U.S. acre is projected nearly unchanged in 2020 compared to 2019. Um, not surveyed farmer early in March, and the producers intended to plant approximately 13.7 million acres of cotton in 2020. However, this focus um, might be a little bit too high and it might not take the effect or capture the effect of the full decline of cotton prices since then. So a new estimate will be updated at the end of June from last acreage report. Uh, with the price being so low recently, what can the industry or cotton farmers prepare to mitigate their risk? Uh, John, I know you have been doing your own acreage forecast based on price ratio. So what is your update forecast for this year? And what is your suggestion for cotton farmers to mitigate the risks? Well, I'll tell you, it's been a, it's been a moving target, even month by month, the, just looking at the relative prices of corn futures, new crop corn to new crop cotton, which is that ratio is across the horizontal axis of this chart. And um, it's, it's been, uh, it would have predicted uh, very low acreage in the fall, but then that prediction increased uh, into the winter. It was as high as 13. This, this chart was predicting as high as 13 million acres planted in January, which incidentally is what the Cotton Council measured during their January time frame uh, grower survey. But then it began to drop again. So right now, looking at the relative price of you know, 330 per bushel, new crop corn futures and uh, 56, 57 cent cotton futures, you'd come up with a ratio of around 5.8 and that would suggest that we're gonna plant around 12 million acres. If, if we do wind up planting 12 million acres, go ahead and advance it. Um, then uh, it plugs into the balance sheet on the far right hand column here, 12 million acres planted, I'll assume 15% abandonment, which is average and an average, low average yield, it comes up, it's pretty easy to pencil out a 17 million bale crop. Now we're, we're carrying over a huge amount, 6.7 million bales from the previous year. So we've got something pushing 25 million bales of supply. That's a lot. It's comparable to previous years. Um, assuming the uh, levels of consumption domestically and exports, which I hope that's not too uh, strong of an assumption given the current climate. Uh, we're going to wind up with ending stocks that are similar to last or similar to the preceding marketing year and they're also at a very high level. 
anything over six is, is high. Anything over 35% stocks to use is high. And that's what it would pencil out to right now. So, you know, just looking at those two, looking at the 1920 marketing year and the 2021 marketing year, looking at either one of those outcomes is a justification for, you know, fundamentally for the futures market trading kind of pretty much where it is in the mid fifties. Yeah, it could, you know, things could happen technically or short run that could push it lower back towards 50 cents or boost it up towards or over 60 cents. What we're basically talking about trading kind of in the no man's land of just above loan rate levels uh, for ice cotton futures. Um, if that's the outcome, then there's, you know, there's not a whole lot that can be done at this point. Uh, go ahead and flip to the next slide. Um, you know, fortunately, we're the market. It's 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 not weakening anymore. It didn't actually sell off after the April WASD the way I thought it would. Apparently, you know, obviously because the market was doing what it was doing, it had already priced in the possibility of bearish numbers, bearish adjustments by USDA. There's also, um, if you think about it, there's not that much commercial business being transacted. So the merchants are not in the market selling futures, hedging uh, their acquisitions. They're just not doing very much of that. So there's no selling, little selling on the commercial side. There's little selling on the speculative side. I'm going to guess because the hedge fund managers don't want to get crosswise with uh, what the Federal Reserve and other central banks are doing around the world, they're creating a lot of inflationary, potential inflationary pressure by creating trillions of dollars and injecting them into the economy. I think that's gonna keep the speculators from going short. Um, I would also say that uh, some, of the, some of the larger levels of ending stocks projected by USDA are in countries like China, India, and the United States, all of whom are actively supporting prices with taxpayer money, that's kind of taking the edge off some of the bearish adjustment in the markets. But still, having said that, we're kind of at, we're at low levels now. And frankly, I, I think we're going to be stuck there in the old crop situation and, and in the new crop situation. But just thinking about the old crop, um, fortunately, if there's one other fortunate wrinkle to the old crop situation, a lot of, a lot of the 2019 bales have already been sold and they were they were marketed prior to this, the worst part of the price decline. So right now, USDA NAS is forecasting a marketing year average of around 59 cents, which that's not profitable, but it's not 50 cents. So that, that'll set us up for uh, the government safety net to sort of do its thing. If you'll advance to the next slide, go ahead and do it one more. Okay, so we're in a situation now, if you think about, this is very simplified, let me say right off the bat, but if you think about cotton that's planted on seed cotton base and is eligible for PLC payments, with a marketing year average price, lint price of 59 cents, I'm gonna assume just for the sake of this graph that that's where a grower would have sold his cotton earlier in the year. Uh, that's, that's not gonna result in any LDP payments, but it will result in a PLC uh, uh, payment just considering 59 cents as the lint price, figuring that into the seed cotton price. Uh, the combination of that would add up to a lint price that's, you know, in the upper 60s or so. Um, again, let me interpret this. This is for a representative farm in the Texas South Plains with ample seed cotton base. You know, that kind of situation would come out with right now, if they'd sold earlier in the year, they'd be coming out with a with a total derived price, uh, realized price, you know, somewhere in the upper 60s, which certainly cushions the, the, the worst of this price decline. Now, if three quarters of them sold when prices were higher, that still leaves a quarter of them who maybe haven't sold at all. And they're in a slightly different uh, uh, safety net position. Go ahead and advance it to the next slide. Um, so if, if, if they haven't sold and prices fell, the, the adjusted world price right now is under the loan rate. So LDP payments are, or payment rates are positive. Um, and so that puts growers in a position of, 
doing doing their several options that they have to basically take advantage of the support price offered by the loan program. They can put it in the loan and redeem it later if prices fall, or they can put it in the loan and take an equity payment from a merchant and just transfer it in the loan to a merchant, or they could forfeit it in the loan, or they could forego the loan and, you know, having sold their cotton in a forward contract or selling it at harvest, uh, they could forego the loan and apply for an LDP. Uh, which one of those is, is the optimal strategy sort of depends on being able to know what prices are going to do over the next month and whether, whether the increase in prices will um, pay for your storage. But anyway, you don't, ultim you don't ultimately know that. So a lot of growers, when you talk to them, they, uh, most of them, if they're marketing their own cotton, a lot of them go for the option of simply selling it and applying for an LDP payment. That seems to be the um, one of the more popular popular options. Go ahead and forward it. So here's a situation for those type of people uh, who are selling later in the year. Um, they'll also get a PLC payment at the same payment rate because the marketing your average price hadn't changed, but the price, the selling price, their market receipts are less. So they're basically trading off some market receipts for, uh, for an LDP payment that'll bring them back up to, to the loan right there. And this is gonna be similar, I think, to what people are gonna see for the 2020 situation. The only difference is the marketing year average price for the 2020 crop, I think maybe, maybe a lot lower than 59 cents. Go ahead and advance it. Um, so the, like I say, if, if things are as bearish as the balance sheet that I showed for the 20 crop, if we wind up with over six and a half million bales of ending stocks uh, for the 2021 marketing year, then I, you know, I don't see any reason for prices to be much different and to trade, you know, between the low to upper 50s, maybe the lower 60s. But basically, I think prices are going to be pretty low, and I think the loan rate will be, you know, will be operational. We'll have positive LDP payments. And so the same, the same choices are there for growers as to whether they uh, put it in the loan, whether they sign up with a pool that puts it in the loan or sign it up with a pool that sells it and takes the LDP on their behalf. Uh, it basically, we're gonna be depending on that program to provide the minimal price support. Go ahead and flip it to see this would be, a, this would be now within a, a marketing year average price of about 50 cents or so. Again, we're going to have um, LDP payments compensating for a, the lower market receipts and we'll have a PLC payment and the, the ultimate total realized price again for this representative farm would be somewhere in the mid 60s. I can't, I can't emphasize how important it was for cotton to have been brought back into uh, Title I uh, commodity programs to provide the support that we're seeing here. Now, having said that, uh, people with seed cotton base, not all your seed cotton base, you know, receives a payment. So to, on those acres that are, that are not being paid, there's what you'd call a not so shallow loss of that blue area. Also, there's new cotton production regions in the North Texas Panhandle and Texas and Oklahoma uh, that don't have a cotton history and they don't have much of any uh, seed cotton base. And so those people are also uh, not getting uh, that portion of PLC support that's depicted in this, uh, in this chart. There's not much you can do about that now. Um, prices having fallen, you know, in the future, if we get rallies and get futures back into the 70s. That's something to consider. That's a portion of unprotected price risk that a grower would have to you know, come in early and forward contract or come in early and put hedges on to protect himself from a decline in futures, you know, from the mid seventies back into the sixties level. That's something they'd have to do themselves because if they don't have seed cotton base, then, then it's going to be up to them to pr protect themselves from that not so shallow loss. Flip it one more time for me. Um, I've had some questions and Yang Juan has two, I think about, uh, you know, should we be doing something to hedge government payments? Um, I've seen those recommendations from brokers out there for people to buy calls. This is earlier on. It's 
right now the issue is probably selling if somebody bought calls when when uh, july futures were at 50 cents or under 50 cents the decision now would be perhaps to sell those calls and the revenue that you would make um, off of that in your brokerage account would be some compensation for the shrinking in LDP payments that would have been realized with with the five cent rally that we've seen in the last uh, in the last few weeks. So I've had other questions about can you do anything to hedge PLC payments? And conceptually, yeah, you could you could buy calls and hang on to them. It's just it's a lot harder to figure the actual compensation and figure the actual numbers because the, you know the PLC payment is kind of convoluted because the price is combined with seed and it's it's just a whole lot more difficult to pencil out. But in theory, uh, if you're owning call options, you're protecting yourselves from rising prices eating away at either LDPs or PLCs. Uh, flip it one more time. I think that may do it uh, for us. Um, Yang Juan, I'll hand it over to you for any comments and to the moderator for any questions. Sure. Um, th thank you both for that information. It was, it was absolutely great. Um, it, it was interesting the way that you set up the PLC um, uh, impact on there. In Tennessee, we run into kind of the opposite problem in, in terms of, of how payments are structured because so our seed cotton base is much higher than what our planted acreage is. So you end up having seed cotton bases being planted to another commodity, but still getting some much higher potential payments through that, that program. And so we're, we're kind of at the, the other end of the spectrum, particularly in some of our West Tennessee um, counties for sure. Uh, one question I did have, uh, and I'd take uh, your opinions from both of you is, there's been rumors of additional purchases to the Chinese reserve. Um, there's been numbers floated out around out there. Um, one, it, is there much to be put in that in terms of do uh, you think that's going to occur? And what would be the potential impact if they did decide to uh, increase their, their reserves? Yeah, that, uh, that's something we noticed uh, last week. Towards the end of last week, there were I would call them rumors of uh, reserve buying of soybeans, of cotton, and other stuff. But they were talking a million metric tons of cotton, which is over four million bales, which is a substantial number. Um, what they would, what I presume they'd be doing, is buying new crop bales to rotate with older bales that have been in the reserve. Um, you know, it was enough to send the market up a couple of cents. The futures market was up on those rumors. And it remains to be seen whether the sales actually occurred. I guess we'll see this coming Thursday if there's large new uh, sales to China. Um, but if the reserve is buying cotton, I, I would just say that's not really an indicator of commercial demand. I mean, if those bales were bought, they're not headed to a spinning mill. They're, they're basically, you're taking, you're taking carry over stocks from outside of China and moving them inside China is what you're doing. Um, I mean, it's, it's good for the books, it's good for the merchants, um, but it's, it's, it's not really an indicator that, that uh, demand is picking up. So I don't really see it as um, that bullish of, of a thing long term. Excellent. Um, Another quick question, you, you kind of mentioned this in when you're talking about prices, uh, but do you see continued low volume and open interest in futures markets? And if so, what are any potential issues that might arise from that, from a producer standpoint? Yeah, well, we certainly have seen a decline um, in uh, open interest. And uh, recently, you now, you know, some of that was just the expiration of the May contract or the expiration of May options and the, the maturing of the May contract. Um, it's, it, it could also be an indicator that just the, the speculators are not, not as active. They're certain they're not jumping in on the short side. Um, what would scare me the most is if um, a large 
section of the index fund guys, which, you know, typically they'd just be rolling forward now. They'd be, they'd be buying July, trading out, you know, selling Mays, buying Julys. If they're just deleveraging um, out of fear and uncertainty or whatever, that would be a bad thing. I mean, the, the, the times in history that the index funds have deleveraged would be those great, terrible events of, you know, the, the uh, uh, great uh, recession and other big widespread financial black swans. And when they did that, they deleveraged out of everything, but the price of cotton just tumbled when all of that buying goes away. So, uh, so I wouldn't want to see that. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, this one's for Dr. Liu. Um, this is a, a quick question just regarding Brazil, where uh, you potentially see their production heading uh, for the current year, um, and then also potentially what we end up seeing in terms of exports out of, out of South America, because we will be uh, in competition with them. So just kind of what some expectations in general are out of, out of Brazil or South America. Um, I expect in this continuing increase, we will continue increasing for this year. Um, with the phase one trade deal signing between US and China, um, that might give us uh, some opportunity to regain the market share in, in China. Um, but since Brazil has already expanded their production, it make it harder for them to, um, to return to back to a pre um, trade trade dispute level, so their production level might be high, but that that is not taking consideration of current outbreak of the virus. So with the virus situation happening right now, uh, with the low cotton demand, so there might be having some acre shifts away from um, cotton to other crops, um, but there's still a lot of uncertainty related to what's the planting situation in Brazil for, especially for next year, because they are the off season of us um, for, um, for, for their production cycle. Yeah, I know one, one of the other ones is always, uh, I follow quite regularly just, and it's not specific to cotton, but is the exchange rate. Um, you know, obviously Brazil's got some, some beneficial exchange rates over the last, uh, last few months. So that's a, that's a, a headwind for, for U.S. exports. I'll close with this question, um, and both of you, I'll give uh, John the first 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 chance, and then we'll move on to Dr. Liu. Um, December futures for the 2020 crop bottomed at about 50 cents, and then rallied uh, over eight cents. Uh, I guess the question would be, have we set that bottom um, on the, the futures contract? And, uh, and what kind of precipitated that increase um, off the bottom? Was it just a question of the, an overreaction um, or do we potentially have more uh, tests of moving lower in terms of futures prices at this point? Well, I, I think the reason that we kind of rallied or rose up from the low 50s to where we are now, 57, 58, uh, I think that was just a little bit of positive news with, with the lack of selling. I think that's what brought us there. Um, I don't think we're out of the woods. I mean, I think, I think uh, the downside price risk is, is still there. Um, it's, it's not uncommon for the May WASD to have a, something about putting those numbers in print <laughs> historically has tanked many a new crop futures uh, market. I've seen that happen before when, you know, you could have projected bearish numbers, but somehow when they show up in the May WASD, that just is the kiss of death. So I don't want that to happen, mind you, but, uh, you know, bearish things could settle in and I think send us back down to the low 50s. So uh, we're not really out of the woods. Yeah, I have the same thought as uh, what John does. Um, I think the bottom 50, if you corresponding the cotton prices at the same time as the stock market prices in the US, uh, you'll see when the cotton price is bottom at lower 50, the stock market also bottom uh, as well. And then after that, the stock market already recovered, so that cotton prices recover as well. So that's what we see the current rally happening right now. Uh, in terms of the upper level 50 um, cents per pound for cotton. 
Um, but related to the future, the pandemic is still going and the impact on economic situation globally is still um, not being fully uh, reflected yet. Uh, so I think um, in the future, there is still downward pressure or downside risk for cotton prices. Uh, as the time goes on, when the consumer uh, really uh, have to reflect uh, well in terms of their changing their purchase behavior uh, after the pandemic and adjusting their spending, um, and also there might have a shift in their income as well. So I'm, I'm also uh, expecting a high rate of downside rates for the future as well. Excellent. Well, thank you to both of you and thank you for people to, for watching this.